So um, I, I guess we're going to get started here. Um, thank you guys for coming. Uh, it's, it's the tail end of the conference. Uh, some of us are here tomorrow, but for a lot of you, you're, you're probably, this is probably it for you. Uh, so we're not going to take very long here. Um, there's two reasons for that. One, like I said, it's the end of the conference. And two, because we did a lightning talk uh, on one of our clouds earlier this week, and we had several questions. So we want to make sure that there's uh, room for enough questions afterwards. Um, so I'm, my name is Joe Topchin. Uh, I'm here with Michael Jones, uh, this guy here. Uh, we were supposed to have a third speaker, Barton Satchwell, but um, he couldn't make it, so it's just going to be the two of us. We work for a company called Cybera. Uh, we're located in Calgary, Alberta. In a nutshell, uh, we play around with new technology and try to figure out what it's good for. Um, things like um, robots and SDN uh, clouds, which will be the focus of this talk. Um, that's where we're located on a map. Um, we also maintain the Alberta portion of the Canadian Research Network. It extends to, um, to all parts of Canada and they're all maintained by organizations similar to us and the names of those organizations are up there. Um, so us and clouds. Um, the first cloud that Cybera worked on was, was called SESWEP. That stands for the Cloud Enabled Space Weather Modeling and Data Assimilation Platform. I don't know how they, yeah. Um, Cybera started with Eucalyptus on that cloud, but they ran into several issues, and uh, OpenStack was started very soon after that. So Cybera jumped to OpenStack. Um, this was before our, I was actually at Cybera, so I don't know too much about this cloud. I came to Cybera with DARE. Um, DARE is the Digital Accelerator for Innovation and Research. We then created a cloud called the LMC Cloud, the Learning Management Cloud. Uh, we also have a cloud called the VCL, which um, is actually, we use the VCL software from uh, the University of North Carolina that was mentioned uh, in the previous session. And the latest cloud that we've launched is uh, RAC, the Rapid Access Cloud. So we're going to talk about uh, these four here. Uh, DARE. Uh, so DARE is a federally funded Canadian public cloud. Um, it provides a free test bed for researchers, small to medium enterprises, uh, who are pre who in a pre-production phase. Um, users of DARE get four cores, four gigs of RAM and four instances, and 200 gigabytes of object storage for free. If, they want, if the users of DARE want more resources than that, um, they can pay for them, and the fee is quite nominal. Um, DARE is physically located in two different parts of can Canada, uh, Alberta and Quebec. They communicate to each other through the Canadian Research Network that I've mentioned earlier. Um, use cases of DARE. Um, it's been used for data analysis, mobile application development, games, game simulations, and some high-performance computing. The OpenStack details of DARE. During the pre-pilot phase, I'm sorry, during the pilot phase in 2012, we used OpenStack Cactus. Uh, it graduated pilot in um, 2013, and we installed Grizzly, which is where it's at currently. And we have plans to upgrade to Havana and then a quick jump to Icehouse later on this year. Um, some internal details about it. Uh, we use Keystone and Template Catalog. We use Glance with the file backend. Uh, we use Nova Network with VLAN Manager. We use Cinder with the NetApp, um, NetApp Appliance. And Swift is just a vanilla install of Swift. There's two regions in DARE. Uh, back when we launched with Cactus, they were actually called zones back then, but we now use uh, regions. The users and images are shared between the regions using a single database table. And then we have created a couple custom scripts and uh, cron daemon event, event listeners to balance the quotas between each region. So if someone launches an instance in Alberta, that's taken off of their quota in Quebec. Lessons learned during the pilot, um, don't be cheap on network equipment. Um, we started out with um, some very cheap 10 gig switches, and those switches crashed a minimum of once a month, probably more like three times a month. We were using iSCSI for our block storage, and every time the switches crashed, we had a lot of data corruption issues. Um, since then, we've learned to, um, to buy decent network equipment. Um, in all of the clouds since then, we've been using uh, Arista switches, Arista 10 gig SFP switches, and um, they've been very awesome to us. Because of the data corruption issues, 
Um, we had a lot of uh, user issues with, um, with well, data corruption. Uh, so we learned a lot of lessons from that. And so when we went into production, uh, we ended up going with uh, NetApp for a central storage appliance. Um, The NetApp also gave us centralized storage, so we were able to start live migrating users, which um, helped us with, uh, with our SLA that we support, um, which is 24-7. Uh, so uh, the Dare cloud is under 24-7 SLA. Uh, the next cloud is the Learning Management Cloud. Um, and the address for that is there uh, on the screen. LMC is a three-year pilot with Alberta post-secondary institutions, so anything from uh, colleges and universities. The goals of that cloud, um, of that project, were to explore cloud-based shared computing resources, explore infrastructure automation as an alternative to platform as a service, and to find out how efficient infrastructure automation can make us. An overview of LMC, it began in production in 2012. It's had a 99.97 .97 uptime. There's four different institutions um, using it with more uh, coming on board. Uh, inside the cloud, there's a total of 270 servers in 18 different environments. There's two full-time employees supporting it, and there's also two full-time employees extending the system. Uh, the point about support is worth commenting on. Um, because one of, the, one of the goals was to um, continue to develop the system after the cloud went live. Um, and that was a very different uh, way of thinking for the universities who, um, who had their systems in place. They didn't want anything to change. Um, and this, this idea of continuously evolving, continuously updating the, um, the environment was, was very scary to them. Um, Use cases for DARE, um, all of the universities, the four institutions that, um, that are currently on it, um, they're hosting their learning platform in infrastructure, such as Moodle. Uh, the supporting infrastructure, such as Post -SQ, uh, PostgreSQL, uh, Varnish, and Logstash are all hosted in that cloud. And um, as I mentioned before, there were 18 environments, so it allows them to, um, to have different development and production and pre-production environments as well. Lessons learned, how to migrate to the cloud, it goes back to um, that and the how to automate leg legacy systems goes back to how the institutions were pretty scared about having, um, you know, the bare metal servers that never got touched, never really got updated, moved into a more continuously evolving environment. Um, and it challenged their traditional policies and procedures. Um, one of the terms that was coined by the LMC team was uh, just-in-time complexity, so the tools and automation that the LMC team did, um, that they created, rather. They created them in such a way that they could be run as a whole or they can be split into little atomic pieces. It's sort of like the Unix way of thinking where you have one tool and you do it well. Um, the tools that the LMC team created were sort of collections of this uh, wrapped around Chef and various Ruby scripts. They call it just-in-time complexity, so if they wanted to do an entire environment build, they could do it, but if they only needed to dig into it, then they could take that tool apart and run it just as, as it was. Um, prescriptive error messages is another big thing that the LMC team really put uh, a lot of effort in. So when they were getting errors, it wasn't just a stack trace or anything like that. It actually it gave a more human readable error. It told them different pointers on what to do, where in our internal docs to look at, um, and you know other things to try. Um, and the last two points, take a mature attitude towards errors and MTTR over MTBF, um, was basically the, the institutions that were part of this, they really didn't like it when we said, this server, came, this server went down, we rebuilt it, everything was fine. They, they wanted no type of errors on the reports that they would have to take upstairs or anything like that. But over time, um, they understood that errors are okay, it's more how fast they can recover for those errors. Um, Traditional audit and compliance systems assumed unchanging systems. Uh, that was a, uh, that goes again with that type of point. Difficult to reconcile with dynamic systems. Uh, tension is healthy and keep things in balance. Compromise and trust is necessary and trust is earned. So that, um, in, in a way, the traditional way of doing things where there was a monthly change window, things like that, um, it really didn't mesh well with the continu uh, continuously evolving part, um, but there were some good pointers to that. Um, sometimes 
with the continuously evolving, if there was a change once a week, once a day, it might take on a bit of a cowboy nature. And so the two sides, the LMC team and the universities, sort of compromised and learned from each other. So the um, constantly evolving way sort of uh, learns to sort of take it easy once in a while while the, um, uh, the unchanging portion of it um, learns that it's okay to change after a while. Uh, and with that, Michael's going to take over for the third and fourth cloud with uh, VCL. Uh, hi. Uh, so VCL was a pilot uh, done with the University of Alberta uh, and ourselves uh, for two and a half years. Uh, the pilot itself is just wrapping up uh, with the University of Alberta uh, taking it over. Uh, the whole point, um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with VCL or not, uh, the virtual computing lab, but the idea would be to spin up a bunch of instances in place of an actual lab students that the students can actually then go use. Um, our goal there was, as Joe had mentioned earlier, uh, it was originally running on ESXi, and then we ported it so we could get it to work with OpenStack. Uh, so we had to modify, someone had written a VCL module uh, to integrate with OpenStack. It uh, wasn't perfect. Uh, so we did end up uh, modifying that. Uh, one of our uh, biggest issues was we don't have a lot of IP addresses. Uh, available to us. So one of the things we had to do was we needed to create a NAT patch uh, so we could use eight IPs instead of the 160 or so that uh, we estimated we were going to need for the lab. Um, and then the other thing we, uh, that was done was it was moved to, the, uh, to OpenStack's Perl API. Uh, and then additionally, uh, VCL expects a certain um, layout, whereas OpenStack uh, provides a much more dynamic layout. For example, VCL, um, when you're uh, creating a new computer, is always expecting the same IP address. OpenStack doesn't believe in that so much. Um, so we had to create some patches and such to work around that, uh, which has made VCL a lot more flexible. Uh, and so one of the things we're also looking at doing with it um, is, is looking at uh, integrating with some of our other clouds. Um, uh, continuing on with that, um, it does only have the one use case on the cloud, so we couldn't, uh, it made overcommitting a little bit more interesting in that memory wasn't as much the issue. It turns out disk IO wasn't as much the issue, but uh, we were more CPU bound. Uh, otherwise, the VCL use cases that we were actually seeing um, there uh, were economics classes, statistics classes, education classes, uh, there were some renewable resource classes, a lot of them either uh, using uh, math programs or uh, custom modules that uh, bolted onto Excel and that kind of idea. So there were 43 cor courses and 1,800 students. Um, and on top of that uh, was uh, cr creating all our golden images and making sure that licensing would keep working and uh, that kind of idea. So the actual OpenStack uh, cloud itself behind the scenes uh, was running Essex. We had Ubuntu on the hardware, and uh, then CentOS was actually running VCL itself. Uh, so we had eight nodes, 64 cores, 128 gigs of RAM. We did have SSDs in there, uh, but again, going back to what I previously said, it turns out disk IO wasn't our major issue, which is what we thought it was. Um, one thing to note, uh, which I'll, I'll get in a little bit, is it would take about 10 minutes or so for a Windows VM to come up, and our problem wasn't actually a disk, uh, we weren't disk bound. Um, as for configuration management, we do like to play a lot with configuration management at Cybera. Um, with VCL, we started with Ansible. Uh, we did try moving to Chef, and at the moment, it was moved back to Ansible. Um, going back to the challenges I was mentioning earlier, um, VCL expected private IPs, we had to put in the, the NAT part. One of the interesting bits with VCL is when it goes to clean things up, it'll start uh, deleting nodes. We've had it twice where it deleted the same management node, uh, and that goes to where it's same expectations in that um, with VCL, it was expecting to be on a public IP, and it could talk to every other node in a public IP. But with everyone in one tenant inside OpenStack, it was actually allowed to delete itself. So we ended up having to work around that. Uh, here's just a quick graph going back to the, to the actual IOPS. The big thing to note here is, if you notice, the top of the graph is only 8,000 IOPS. Our RAID 0 of SSD can provide 50,000 without blinking. Our problem was not disk I.O., uh, like people were uh, thought. Um, and so we, while we had done a lot of work to try to improve the boot times um, on the VCL images, uh, what most people thought it was, that's what it wasn't. 
Um, so the biggest lessons that we pulled out of the, our, our VCL one here, uh, double NAT can actually be surprisingly stable. Uh, golden image sprawl is always an issue. Uh, and license management, um, well, it's, it's, it's there in the traditional uh, way. It doesn't go away even with golden images, uh, especially with um, uh, so some programs. If you're lucky, they'll use a license server, which uh, moves it away. Other times, they have to be relicensed every year, which means you've got to update your golden image. Heaven forbid you update one golden image, but don't update it in another, and then use the one that doesn't have it updated. It can prove to be quite a bit of work. Uh, going forward, we're looking at integrating it with uh, one of our other clouds, uh, and then we're modifying the, um, the module to work with Havana and eventually Icehouse because it only works with Essex right now. Uh, we are talking to the VCL development team. Um, while I'm not actually part of the team talking to them, so I'm not sure exactly where it's at, but uh, we're, we're hoping to provide them some uh, uh, a test environment that they can use as well. Another thing we're looking at is something called virtual memory streaming. Uh, in this case, it was actually a product from GridCentric. The idea behind virtual memory streaming uh, is that we can boot up an instance in about three minutes instead of 10 minutes. And otherwise, other, uh, um, other ways to better remote access the actual VMs, because we had just been using standard uh, remote desktop protocol so far. Uh, but we we're looking at things like Cord and that kind of idea. And then our last cloud, which is kind of our favorite cloud, the Rapid Access Cloud, which we just uh, re-implemented uh, two months ago. Um, this one here, in, in many ways, is very similar to the way we have architected DARE, um, although in a much newer fashion. So it's actually a free public cloud. Uh, it has a lot of the same use cases as what you can find with DARE. Uh, in that it's, uh, but it's more aimed at researchers. So anyone in Alberta, whether they're a startup, just an entrepreneur, or someone wanting to play around um, with cloud resources, uh, is able to just go in and sign up. Uh, by default, they're given up to eight cores, eight gigs of RAM, eight instances, 500 gigs of block storage. Uh, object storage just went online uh, earlier this week. And if they want to, they can email us and ask us. Um, but one of the biggest things we're most excited about this cloud is every instance has full IPv6, uh, sorry, excuse me, full IPv6 access. So, um, so again, one of the, our biggest limiting factors is we don't have a lot of IPv4 addresses, but we have a whole lot of IPv6 addresses. Um, again, use cases we're actually seeing on there, we've got several classes from the University of Alberta that are using them uh, for Hadoop. Uh, classroom workshops, both that we've run ourselves and at the universities. Uh, there's been a couple hackathons by the various uh, either incubators or uh, just kind of hacking groups uh, within uh, locally that have used it quite a bit. Uh, and then the fun one uh, was an email we got yesterday uh, was one of our previous users, uh, their, uh, their paper had just gotten published in Science to do with uh, researching on lemurs. So going forward from there was to find out what land should be saved in order to protect the lemurs. Uh, as for the actual details behind the scenes, we're currently running Havana. Uh, it's based in two regions, uh, Edmonton and Calgary. It's actually hosted at the universities. Uh, and we actually have two active-active cloud controllers in each region. Uh, each of the components, so Nova, Cinder, Glance, et cetera, uh, run in each of their own LXC containers on, on the controllers. Otherwise, Keystone, uh, again, very similar to Dare, we're just running a template ca uh, catalog. Glance is currently using a file backend, and we, uh, we just rsync the files between the two regions uh, every half hour or so. Although we're looking at using Swift instead, it'll be a little easier. Uh, Cinder, we're using the GlusterFS driver. Um, because, we did, because of the budget on this one, we decided to use the hard drives inside each of the nodes and then created one large shared storage that way. So we're using Gluster that, uh, Gluster that way. Uh, and, then we have, and then just due to the high availability nature of the cloud, uh, we use a clustered version of RabbitMQ. And then for SQL, we're using Percona with Galera. Uh, the other big thing, we're using Nova Network on this one. Uh, we couldn't get IPv6 working with Neutron, so we're sticking with Nova Network. Uh, it just uses flat DHCP. Uh, it's not very large, and again, it has a public IPv6 address that's up and running and available. Uh, the IPv6 address isn't actually configured through OpenStack. Uh, it's done through an upstream RA. And that's about it for just what our four clouds are. Uh, I'm hoping that you're able to get some details from the architecture. Uh, otherwise, if you have any questions, the mics are available. Thank you.
care who the uh, cheap switch vendor was. <laughs> Sorry? I was wondering if you guys would be willing to share who the buggy switch vendor was. It's four letters long. Do you want to say? Um, well, it was, so it was um, Dell's earlier switches, which um, are no longer available anymore. And so um, we have been in talks with, with Dell about the, the past issues that we've had. Um, Dell was aware of uh, the issues that we were having with the switches. And so the actual models and um, uh, what the switches were based off of. I forget which company that, um, that Dell purchased the, the switches or um, uh, bought the company. Um, they're, they're just no longer available anymore. So um, nothing against Dell or anything like that. Um, we, all of the clouds that you just saw are actually running on Dell hardware, but the switches itself uh, were older Dell switches. We're loving our Arista switches. Yes. So kudos to the V6. Um, and the other thing... Uh, I wanted to ask is uh, that last one, the, the rack cloud that you have there, mm -hmm. um, you said you were actually basically doing kind of a, um, a, a sync uh, for a glance from one region to the other. Um, who are your tenants exactly for that? I, I mean, like, how are you sort of guaranteeing that they're not accidentally spinning up off of an older glance? I mean, do you guys care? Yeah. Like, well, if you could rewind a couple slides, yeah. maybe I misunderstood how you there. Um, set up. Going, it's file backend. Um, in, in our case, like images are uploaded or changed infrequently. Like we might see one kind of a day. Um, so we ha aren't really worried about that. There is a chance that said uh, users are kind of made aware of that ahead of time. Like if, uh, for example, if they take a snapshot of uh, an instance in Calgary, uh, we, we do tell them in the documentation that no, it won't be available in the Edmonton region for a half hour. So they, they're expected to wait uh, some time until it's actually available. Uh, one of the reasons we want to move to Swift was it would, rem it would remove that window that's open. Uh, but in practice, we haven't seen any issues. Yes. Yeah, in your first example, you mentioned uh, you switched to NetApp's, I guess, uh, shared storage or enterprise storage. Um, and you mentioned that there is reliability improved and uh, improvements as well as availability, right? Which is, in, it enabled live migration. In your follow-on project, uh, have you used enterprise storage anywhere else or are they pretty much captive internal storage? Um, no, no, we haven't actually used um, an enterprise-grade storage like NetApp in our cloud since. Um, one reason is because of the, the budgets that we're under with these different clouds. Um, NetApp is sometimes just too expensive for that. And the other reason is when we made the decision to use NetApp, um, projects like Gluster and Ceph were, were a bit too um, early uh, for us to trust in production, whereas um, Nowadays, in, uh, for example, in our Rack Cloud, as you can see, we are using Gluster for different parts. And um, if our SLA required a live migration type um, uh, scenario, we would have easily used Gluster to just do the shared storage between instances. Um, so it's a mixture of the cost of the NetApp and uh, the SLA and the open source technologies available right now that we haven't used NetApp since. Just a little bit more about the. Uh, the oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You got, you, go ahead. Just a little bit more about the NetApp. Um, how, do you guys back that up right now? Do you have dual NetApps or anything like that? Right. Right. So each each region actually has two NetApp controllers, um, and. Um, yeah, yeah, so everything's highly available. If one controller goes down, the other one picks up the disks and the other shelves of disks, uh, things like that. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, going back to the VLC um, cloud, what, were the, what was the profile of that? I, I didn't profile in terms of... Well, um, like, so what are you guys running? Is it, is it Havana? Uh, is it KVM? Oh, right, right. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's uh, OpenStack Essex at the moment. Uh, it's a KVM for the hypervisor. Um, the hardware are the Dell 6220s. Okay. And, um, yeah. So, so with the overcommit ratio that you talked about, um, or, or the CPU being CPU bound, did you, did you find it was the overcommit ratio? And what did you guys do to, did, you, did you bring it down to one to one? Is it two to one? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, neither of us are on the, the VCL project, so I'm, we're not too sure of the actual implementation details like that. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. So the, the good news is, it, in practice, it wasn't, uh, it, it, it wasn't that bad. It was usually when we were bringing up instances. Um, that said, uh, 
uh, I'm not sure where. Uh, I'll, I'll try to contact you after. Uh, yeah, the the guy who was working on it was actually here uh, last Friday uh, giving a talk just about that, and then he was actually discussing the exact issues. Uh, so I'll give you my card and I'll get you uh, yeah, I'd love the, 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 the link to that. Yeah, I'd love to pick um, his brain because we have a very similar problem uh, moving some workloads. We purchased a company and we're trying, we've been migrating their workloads, um, Windows workloads into uh, OpenStack on KVM and it's just been a really pain mm -hmm. in the ass. We're just, we're just figuring out that part of it's the overcommit ratio, but it's also, we have issues with the images coming up and that, but we just have just general issues with performance now, so mm -hmm. we'd love to hear more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I, I have a question about that. I think it applies to the Dare instance. Um, on the Nova network, are you running one instance or are you running one on each compute host? Uh, for Dare, Nova network is a single host. Uh, for Rack, it's multi host. So you're a multi host deck. Mm -hmm. And are you noticing, is that? caused by just legacy, or, or, or did you do that because some of them are, are doing more traffic externally? Um, with Dare, it was, it was a bit of legacy. Uh, it was what we knew at the time when we implemented Dare um, about a year and a half ago. Um, with, um, um, with, with Rack, it was, uh, we were more experimenting with it. Um, so we, it was the first implementation of multi-host for us, uh, but we had the, the ability to give it a shot and see if it worked. And also public IP addresses are also a big constraint on it as well. Uh, for each compute node that we put in multi-host, it consumes one public IP. Um, so that's, that's also a huge factor for us. And, and what was the size of that? How many compute hosts are there on that one? Sure, um, so for Rack, we have a total of 15, 14 or 15. Yeah, 14, uh, 14 or 15, 15 right now, and Dare is at 36. Yes. Actually, the other gentleman brought up a very good point on backup. So because you're replicating between two sites, you're not doing any backup on those clouds? In this case, you're, you're correct. Um, both of them, uh, but both, both Dare and Rack are aimed very much at non-production uh, non uh, workloads and such. It's made very explicit ahead of time we aren't making backups. Um, it's not so much we can't, as it's just not feasible for what we're trying to provide. Great. So we give the ability for the users to snapshot, to our sync their data off, and, and basically <clears throat> uh, handle the backups themselves. Any other questions? Thank you guys very much. Thank you.